but our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Pabini Ray Murray, is on the faculty of uh, Srishti Institute of Art and Des Design and Technology in Bangalore, India, where she runs the Digital Humanities Program. Her research interests and publications encompass comics, game studies, feminism, feminist protest, the history of the book, so the role of cultural specificity in the digital world. She is currently vice chair of Global Outlook, Digital Humanities, the editor-in-chief of, of SHARP, Society for the History of Authorship, Reading, and Publishing, kind of a classic 90s organization, history <laughs> of the book, um, news, and she does the newsletter for them, and managing editor of DH Commons. She's also, uh, as you've observed through her comments here and other ways, an, an astute observer of the trajectories of DH as it's practiced in a variety of global contexts and the differences that obtain in these situations. In her 2015 essay, Making Culture, Locating the Digital Humanities in India, she writes, as the digital humanities grows more visible in South Asia, it is necessary to recognize the ways in which disciplinary practices might diverge in these regions, owing to the exigencies of language, rate of technological growth and obsolescence, and different institutional cultural histories, all of which combine to create an alternative definition of what the discipline might offer. The contours of the discipline necessarily shift with both geographical and intellectual location and theoretical practice emerging in the global south, which is what the essay is focusing on, has to adapt to different infrastructures, languages, and technologies. In that paper, she explored this difference through the concept of jugad, uh, a MacGyver-esque term that suggests uh, an indigenous combination of making do, hacking, and frugal engineering. Um, uh, and so she's engaging with the whole hack yak thing through this wonderful kind of original focus. Um, in this way, her work offers a new cultural correlatives and reconceptions as it continually seeks to add further nuance to ongoing discussions as to the state of the field and indeed extend the limits of the discipline. It is precisely this sensitivity that our present moment calls for. And so we welcome Padmini. Her present paper is entitled Dismantling the Master's House practicing DH in the Global South. so much uh, for inviting me. Um, this has been such a joy. Uh, it's been truly global, which is uh, such, such an amazing thing. Um, as I've said to Steve and others, it's also been a fantastic opportunity to learn from colleagues um, and to learn kind of the methodologies and the approaches that they're using, not necessarily in um, the Anglo-American sphere, but elsewhere. And so many of these um, ideas and ways of working, I think, are going to be truly relevant, transferable, transposable to our context. So it's been very educational. And thank you all so much for your collegiality and your generosity. Um, so I'm going to start off today uh, with a bit of a confession, disclaimer, <laughs> not quite sure. Um, so there was an amazing conference that was hosted by Susan Brown and her colleagues uh, in 2015 called Digital Diversity. And I think uh, it kind of ushered in a moment where we started paying more attention to this idea of diversity, which admittedly sometimes can uh, seem like an add-on or a uh, politically correct uh, move or gesture. But I think at this particular conference, it was anything but. And it was very, very exciting to be there. And again, to meet colleagues um, from different communities who I had personally never seen represented before. And I'm sure they felt the same about me. Um, so I uh, made a bit of a stir with a statement that I made at that conference. Um, I proclaimed rather audaciously, your DH is not my DH. Um, 
and uh, everyone was very gracious about <laughs> this uh, this declaration. Uh, but now, kind of, you know, with the with the hindsight of age <laughs> and um, also two years of working in India, so I should I should mention that the Digital Diversity Conference happened just after I had moved back to India after 15 years in the UK. So I too was getting used to what it meant to be working in India in the digital humanities and have uh, learned a lot of lessons along the way. And so what I hadn't bargained on uh, learning was that, uh, quote, my DH was a mere distraction from the work um, that really needed to be done. There could be no place for my DH without acknowledging that the whole idea of the humanities in India needed to be rehabilitated and resuscitated, and that we had very little by way of infrastructural or archival foundations on which to build this idea of the new humanities. Radically different technological and infrastructural conditions, as well as historical, mean that this, means that this narrative diverges, obviously, from those that underpin established histories of Anglo-American digital humanities. And this difference necessitates alternative methodological approaches in order to uh, reconstruct alternative history. So as um, Steve mentioned, uh, my work um, regarding Jugar is a kind of gesture towards looking at that. Um, the work of Gentry Sayers, who has been a great inspiration for me, um, and others at Maker Lab at the University of Victoria on their cultural kits for history, for example, while emphatically not exercises in replication and more in remediation, and in foregrounding, quote, how the past is interpreted through present conditions, exhibiting history as a collection of refreshed traces with both loss and gain, close quote, often relies on historical material culture, such as patent documents, illustrations, artifacts, in order to inform their creation, much of which is conserved and made available by, by Victorian values of empire building and taxonomic collection. And as somebody mentioned yesterday, um, that obviously means, I think it was Annalise uh, who men mentioned that, there's a certain overdetermination of which records stay because the bureaucratic records or patent records or those records very frankly, that are in the interest of industry and capitalism, are the documents that remain. Um, and as a consequence, try as I might to reconstruct uh, the kind of work that Gentry does, uh, it's impossible. We don't have those documents. Um, and there's, a, there's an excellent essay um, written by an architect, actually, about the history of design um, when it was kind of started in, um, in Britain and kind of exported or imported into India, about how whatever was made by craftspeople in India was not deemed as something that could be patented. So Paisley, for example, the, the pattern Paisley, uh, because it was an overflow of some kind of primitive creativity as opposed to any other form of design that was coming out of Britain. So this kind of very blatant um, racism when it came to um, design and intellectual property. Um, so yeah, so the, the history of indigenous technologies in India is often patchy and obscured by more visible archival material, which um, asserted colonial structures of oppression, complicating the use of modes of inquiry such as gentries um, for digital humanities work in India. So you know, even if we wanted to adapt it as a methodology, it's something that requires a lot of um, a lot of reconsideration uh, before we kind of uh, think about bringing it into our teaching and our research. I am keen to posit uh, our current engagement with DH in India as a necessary phase, but not one whose outcome further embeds the discipline rather than its practices in the academic landscape. So basically, I'm trying to say that digital humanities is dead. <laughs> Long live the digital humanities. <laughs> um, uh, because I think it's because of the, the, the particular moment that we're at. Um, I don't want to, and, and, and this goes against everything that I do, I run a master's in digital humanities, um, but I don't want to, um, to kind of transpose it into our space uh, without being thoroughly nuanced about it. Um, and so I think what we're actually talking about is the humanities, and I'll, as I go on, I hope it'll become clear um, why that's increasingly uh, crucial to observe. Um, is that I feel we should be using DH in India as a jumping off point and tactical mode for enlarging the scope of the humanities in general in order to prize open institutional resistance to accommodate and legitimize essential research in fields such as Dalit, feminist, and indigenous studies. These interrogations of received knowledge must operate on different terrains. Um, so these are the, the kind of areas that I feel we need to uh, 
completely rebuild from the ground up, which, as you can probably tell, is everything. <laughs> um, so ontologies, epistemologies, archives, praxis, pedagogies, and histories, all of these work in tandem with each other. Uh, they do not operate in isolation and are necessarily complementary and reciprocal in their scope. But this roadmap, as it were, allows us to think constructively about what is at stake and hopefully serve as a compass for the work that we need to do going forward. As I hope the rest of my talk will demonstrate, we need to, sorry, as I hope the rest of my talk will demonstrate, these are necessarily inextricable from one another, and it is essential to remain alert to all of these while we delineate what might account for digital humanities work in India. Uh, so the first uh, facet of this I will look at are, is the idea of histories. So as early as 1792, the superintendent of the East India Company's trade activities, evangelist and erstwhile military man Charles Grant, articulated a justification for introducing Western knowledge, values, and English education to India in his observations on the state of society among the Asiatic subjects of Great Britain, particularly with respect to morals and the means of, the means of improving them. Grant's proposal was as follows, and that's what you uh, see here. The true cure of darkness is the introduction of light. The communication of our light and knowledge to them would prove the best remedy for their disorders, which uh, Grant described as ignorance, um, and if this remedy is proposed from a full conviction that if judiciously and patiently applied, it would have great and happy effects upon them, effects honorable and advantageous for us. Um, this narrative of how such ideological formulations underpinning a colonial agenda shaped the basis of school and higher education uh, in India are now well rehearsed. The work of scholars such as Gauri Vishwanathan, Harish Devedi, Priyambada Gopal have argued how these were hegemonic interventions enlisted by the British to perpetuate their rule and to create a bureaucratic workforce that would enable them to do so. Others, such as Alok Mukherjee and Radhika Parameshwaram, have gone on to demonstrate how these hegemonies still resonate in post-independence India, granting cultural capital to a high caste elite. Although, as Mukherjee also proposes, Quote, English is the terrain on which women, Dalits, and other people with a transformational agenda, for example, are waging their own wars of position in the name of broadening the uh, English curricula and making them more exclusive or applying different critical frameworks. Uh, I will just clarify here uh, for people who might not be aware, Dalit is a uh, a term used for non-dominant caste peoples. It is the term that they use to define themselves. Uh, traditionally, the way that it has often been um, discussed is upper caste and lower caste, caste, high caste, low caste. Obviously, these are extremely uh, insulting and derogatory terms. Uh, so it's dominant caste or non-dominant caste, but the Dalits prefer to use the word Dalit for themselves. Um, so yes. The implementation of these ideological imperatives is challenged by Dhruv Raina in his reimagining re the university after the Yashpal Committee report. He questions the very idea of the 19th century university of culture as an ideal for contemporary times. Pointing out that the era of the Humboldtian university or the university of culture was the result of simultaneous revolutions in the cognitive, intellectual, institutional realms, he observes that today, the modes of knowledge production have changed drastically, necessitating the reimagining of uh, the university as an institution. Sanjay Seth attempts to forward an explanation for this elision in uh, his book, Subject Lessons posing the question of how Western knowledge acquired the current status of being the only mode of knowledge uh, from being one of many modes of knowing, Seth in his book examines the consumption and the reception of this modern Western knowledge in the Indian context. Um, so many, many Indians uh, have this universal experience when they leave their country, when people ask them, oh, you speak such good English. <laughs> um, and, uh, and this is in complete ignorance of the fact that every single one of those people probably went to an English medium school, the first language that they grappled with at uh, nursery and kind of lower levels were, was English. So, um, so this legacy uh, has obviously shaped the way that the Indian subject has um, conceived of themselves. Locating his analysis along the lines of a Foucauldian project of the history of knowledge which constitutes a privileged point of view for the genealogy of the subject, Seth points out that the new knowledges do not just enter the heads of the people to permeate it with new ideas, but also serve to produce a new subject. 
arguing that modern knowledge creates a knowing subject who is set apart from the objects to be known. He points out that the subject, in this once novel conception of knowledge, was not already present but had to be created through new pedagogic practices and disciplines created by industrialization, capitalism, modern armies, and the modern novel. In contemporary India, the institutional biases still perpetuate these newer forms of modernity through the performance of producing a neoliberal techno-social citizen. So all of this to establish that our conceptions of the humanities in India are thoroughly shaped by a colonial legacy, produced in service to national interests other than our own. Maybe then it is not so remarkable that what we now commonly accept as the digital humanities came into being as a fortunate byproduct of the aggrandizement of another national interest at another time, that of the USA in the early 20th century. Digital humanities cannot exist without specialized infrastructure. Unlike the tools of scholarship that has sustained humanities work for centuries, ink and paper, DH requires applications, computational devices, and networks. Tara McPherson's important contribution to digital humanities scholarship, an essay that appeared in the first de debates in the digital humanities volume, um, entitled Why Are the Digital Humanities So White, describes how Multix, an early blueprint for Unix, the computer operating system which laid the foundation for the Mac OS as well as Linux, influenced other systems as well, um, such as Windows, was funded by ARPA, Advanced Research Projects Agency of the Defense Department, for $2 million a year for eight years. But as is probably evident by now, that the invention of these technologies, significant as they were, forms only part of the origin story of the digital humanities. The catalyst for the encounter between humanities scholarship and these emergent technologies was the seemingly unlikely um, figure of Father Roberto Busa, and I do not need to rehearse this story here. But what I would like to um, bring up is Busa's own uh, definition of humanities computing. And he said, humanities computing is precisely the automation of every possible analysis of human expression. Therefore, it is exquisitely a humanistic activity in the widest sense of the word, from music to the theater, from design to painting to phonetics, but whose nucleus remains the discourse of written texts. And it's this um, latter phrase that I'm going to um, pose some contention with. Busa's emphasis on the written is an inevitable opinion of somebody who is heir to the Christian scriptural tradition and begs the question whether such an emphasis can be easily transposed to our locally and culturally specific epistemological conditions, and when I say our, I mean India, which even today are shaped as much by orality, making, and embodied knowledges as they are by print and the digital. The narrative of the relatively recent arrival of DH in the university has been accompanied by mythologies of instant shiny success especially in the US, where naysayers claim that it has been increasingly seen as the younger, sexier sibling to literary and cultural studies, edging out established scholarship and repeatedly triumphing in the academic hunger games of institutional funding. <laughs> but as is often the way with uh, the successful and the apparently self-assured, there is beneath this veneer of achievement a deep self-regarding anxiety about its identity and its role in contemporary academia. A recently updated 2016 edition of a seminal digital humanities text, a companion to digital humanities, edited by Susan Schreibman, Ray Siemens, and John Unsworth, which was originally published in 2004, dedicates four separate sections to this meta-conversation, both in the context of interdisciplinarity and the, quote, ever-emergence of the discipline, inserted alongside several chapters dedicated largely to methods and approaches. The format itself serves as an emblem for DH and its nervousness about asserting itself as a disciplinary category, embodying the tension between hack and yak, terms that were used in their initial context in 2008 to differentiate between making, building, and theorizing, but where the latter finds itself persistently saddled with a navel-gazing myopia. Alan Liu provides a more nuanced take on the hack versus yak debate. He writes, at core, the debate is not really about theorized critique, versus something other than such critique. Indeed, the debate situates the digital humanities at a fork between two branches of late humanities critique. One, a hack branch, sometimes referred to as critical making, affiliates with, but is often more concretely pragmatic than thing theory, the new materialism, actor network theory, assemblage theory, and similar late post-structuralist theories. The other, a yak branch, 
descends from the not related critical traditions of the Frankfurt School critical theory, deconstruction, Foucauldian archaeology, cultural materialism, postcolonial theory, and gender and race theory, especially as all of these have now been inflected by media studies. These exploratory engagements are not restricted to the US alone. Uh, and closer home, P.P. Sneha's significant and necessary document commissioned by the Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore as part of their paper series entitled Mapping Digital Humanities in India rehearses this tension yet again. She writes, while this study began as an attempt to understand the growing interest around the term itself in India, its scope has extended to explore what specific contexts and conditions are in place in India and what gives it a critical purchase. Five universities now offer various programs in digital humanities in India, ranging from a master's degree to certificate courses, and there have been several workshops, winter schools, seminars, and one national level consultation over the last five years. Academic and applied practices focus on the building of digital archives, film studies, game studies, textual studies, cultural heritage, and critical making, just to name a few. While these efforts have managed to create a growing interest in digital humanities, there is still a lack of consensus on what exactly constitutes the field in India. Thus questions around definition, ontology, and method remain pertinent, as does the need for recognition by the national academic bureaucracy. And the national academic bureaucracy that she's speaking about is the University Grants Commission um, that uh, grant um, degrees, and they do not recognize digital humanities as an academic category at all. Um, these considerations, as Sneha points out, also act as a corrective to the notion that um, conceptions of digital humanities as a discipline are universal. The originary narrative underpinning its emergence in Anglo-American academic discourse necessarily diverges in India and other countries in the global south due to differences in access, language, social cultural mores, and infrastructure. Sneha also gestures towards the need for caution when applying DH to the Indian landscape. She writes, this mapping did not begin with an assumption of a field called DH being extant in India, and therefore as an examination of its challenges and possibilities, but rather to understand how DH-like practices have evolved and converged at the moment under what appears to um, be like a placeholder term, and the implications for this uh, research and learning. As the work of Shukanta Chaudhary, Radhika Gajala, Loris Liang, Nishant Shah, Ravi Shundaram, and others have shown, there is a distinct need for digital humanities scholarship to incorporate its own histories of computing and internet use, while always remain, remaining alert to its own exigencies of cultural and linguistic difference and political histories, which inevitably inflect outcomes such as who is empowered to build digital resources and archives, who is empowered to access and use such uh, resources, and consequently who is represented online and how. While academics and thinkers in India are well aware of these developments, the development of digital humanities in India coincides with a key intellectual moment, that of the challenging of the hegemony of English literary studies in the university space, and more generally in the humanities university curriculum, both of which are these persistent remnants of a colonial legacy. The emergent sites of digital humanities scholarship in India, therefore, are not only found in the formal university space, uh, an excellent example of which is the School of Cultural Texts and Records at Jalapu University, but also in the work of such um, institutions such as the Center of Internet and Society, uh, Sarai, which for the past 15 years has been working with academics, as well as in collaboration with artistic practitioners, focusing on, quote, the interface between cities, information, society, technology, and culture. Um, information infrastructures, histories and contemporary practices, and social media, contemporary histories and archaeologies, as well as my own work at Shrishti, which is a design school, and thus uh, places an emphasis on making as a mode of thinking through humanities concepts, while privileging historical, social cultural, and political, politically contextual understandings of local use and the creation of indigenous technologies, both within and without the realm of the, te the digital. While the technocratic state <coughs> demands subjects who are willing and able to, ooh, sorry, <laughs> who are willing and able to um, align themselves with um, the notion of Make in India and Digital India, which are both uh, initiatives that the current prime minister um, put into play, uh, the rapid use of use, sorry, the rapid rise of usage and internet penetration has also coincided with the increasing centralization of the web created by tech behemoths such as Google and Facebook which in the humanities, sorry, which creates an even more grave situation for those of us 
who see our work in the humanities as preserving the past and the contemporary moment for future generations. The bulk of internet activity now occurs on social networking sites. Search and mobile apps are therefore funneled through proprietary algorithms which legislate the visibility of content and can only be challenged by the active creation of archives, a still nascent undertaking in India due to lack of expertise and training and interest. I hope it has become apparent in my talk thus far why, to my mind, a manifesto of values that we should champion and prioritize in DH practice in India needs to be necessarily tended to with some urgency and alertness to our particular context. Our central concerns going forward should be addressing multilingualism and representation in the archive, while understanding and acknowledging that the history of oppression is always bound up with the history of technology and that the tools that we use to make our lives easier often have severe implications for personal and political freedom of many kinds, and that in order to ensure social justice, it might be necessary to create interventions and or build tools that reflect our local and regional needs. Uh, so at this point, I want to uh, quickly allude to what I've uh, described as archive jamming. Um, it's uh, a way of I guess I was trying to think of a name for something that I feel needs to be done in India right now, which is to approach archives in a generative way, in a generous way, um, in a non-single author authored way, but also to be maybe playful, to be maybe subversive. So basically activating the archive as a place for politics, for a place of um, protest, rather than um, uh, to kind of align itself with the very formal <laughs> and uh, traditional way that India's own national archives position themselves. Uh, I think one of the most telling things about the National Archives of India website is that when they talk about their collections, they talk about them uh, in terms of kilometers. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's appalling that this, this is our flagship national archive. Um, their, their technologies and their uh, methodologies are highly suspect, um, and they don't actually have uh, um, somebody in harness right now as heading up the institution. Uh, there have been charges of corruption. So yes, uh, that's what we're up against. Um, so my response to that is that we uh, don't look to the government uh, to help us create archives, we create our own. Uh, and which is a ridiculously ambitious um, and possibly foolhardy <laughs> um, undertaking, but I'm hoping that in the rest of my paper I'll be able to um, kind of demonstrate some gestures towards how we might do that. How many Okay, I'll just keep going. <laughs> Clearly, it's not a problem. Uh, I don't want to keep people from alcohol, but you know. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> So I, I wanted to uh, first kick off with uh, a project that I'm currently involved with. Um, this is called, uh, so the project is called Two Centuries of Indian Print. It is um, in conjunction with the British Library, as of course you can tell, um, with Jadhpur University in Calcutta and Shrishti. Um, is there sound if I pay for that? Yeah, yeah. there's sound. Yeah, great. Uh, so yeah, maybe just watch the video and it will give you an idea of what it's about. What the British Library holds in terms of its collections is the world's cultural heritage. And what we're hoping to do in this project is to make it freely available so it can be accessed by anyone anywhere in the world. We've actually started scanning our early printed Bengali collections. Before they can be scanned, obviously, they undergo a conservation assessment. Whatever is fit to be digitized goes to be digitized. Whatever isn't fit to be digitized is conserved and then digitized at a later date. This is a vast body of material, part of which has never been seen before by any researchers, which we are looking to put online. And that once that is put together, once that is out, out there, it would constitute easily one of the, the biggest database of Indian South Asian printed materials anywhere in the world and would fundamentally alter the landscape of research. What it does do is give us a really great idea of um, the kind of material that was being written which was very extensive, you know, anything from kind of geography, history, erotica. So it kind of sheds a new light on what we know of cultural production in the time. Essentially you're building an architectural tool into which you can feed in 
other South Asian languages as well. So we'd like this project to be kind of the benchmark for similar kinds of projects in the future. The time and the compulsion behind carrying out such a project could not have been more urgent. And it is therefore very important for anyone who cares about culture and reading in South Asian languages to really come to the aid of this project. This is an absolute crying need for this material to be digitized and put online. So yes, um, the Two Centuries of Indian Print project um, basically aims to digitize 200,000 pages of Bengali books um, that were published uh, between the late 1700s and the early 1900s. Uh, the reason why Bengali was the language that um, was chosen as the first language, because British Library, unsurprisingly, has the largest number of South Asian language uh, content outside South Asia, um, was because Abhijit Gupta, who was featured in that video, um, put together a short title catalog of all the extant Bengali books uh, in the world. Uh, therefore, we had um, a guide to um, decide which books uh, were going to be digitized. Um, the plan is that uh, this will be a two-year project, and we're kind of midway now. Uh, and then the next language to be uh, digitized will be Tamil and then Urdu. Um, we had considerable pushback from the Indian government who were upset that we were not doing Sanskrit manuscripts. Um, but I think you know, manuscripts actually because of their very um, you know, because of their political positioning, actually get a lot of care and a lot of um, conservation uh, attention paid to them. So uh, we, we kind of felt like this would be a, a good idea um, to undertake. Um, what has been exciting about this project is that I tend to think of it as an act of digital repatriation. Uh, when I said that phrase in the British Library, there was like, <gasps> <laughs> um, but it's true, it's true, and it needs to be done. Um, and I think um, when Doc Porter was talking about their project at UPenn yesterday, um, it, it, it obviously kind of resonated because um, we, we too were kind of um, keen that it be um, as widely available, and it will be. So, the, so all of these 200,000 pages are going to be freely available to anybody in the world uh, with access to the internet. Um, what we are also doing, which we hope will um, kind of sustain the project and uh, thinking about digitization in India, is that we're doing small workshops with small libraries in West Bengal who don't have training in digitization or in metadata management. Uh, and we are not completely disinterested in this, um, in this endeavor because what we realize much to our um, alarm is that no library catalog in India is interoperable with other library catalogs. There are no open APIs, uh, so it's very, very difficult. And of course, language is a problem, so metadata is actually all we have to work with. So if, not, if um, there isn't a, a persistent, um, or oh, sorry, consistent metadata standard uh, for all these libraries, then we are going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, and so that has been great. I think a lot of uh, a lot of these libraries are extremely grateful to have some guidance um, from an institution like the British Library on how to manage their collections and how to manage digitization. Uh, there will be a conference later this year, um, kind of a, a kind of book history conference in July, and then a more digital humanities inflected one, which I will be hosting at Trishti, which will be about typography and design, uh, which we're very excited about. Uh, we're going to be 3D printing uh, some of the fonts that uh, were used in these books. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a, quite a thrilling project to be working with. Um, but what's also wonderful is that the portal will also uh, include the catalogs from the other libraries as well as the British Library's holding, so it will kind of bring them together as a single corpus um, and hopefully facilitate scholars both in South Asia and, and abroad. So I think that's kind of one way that I kind of imagine archive jamming as a kind of way of uh, kind of um, you know getting back what we can <laughs> from the from the colonizers, but um, but also kind of making that generative, making that useful, making that uh, kind of um, a, you know a necessary contribution to our cultural heritage. Um, a very different way of doing that is this, the game that I mentioned earlier this morning um, called Antariksha Sanchar. Uh, this was a game that was set in Tamil Nadu and I was complaining why it wasn't in Tamil. Um, it's a point and click adventure that was uh, inspired by Ramanujan, who is or was a very uh, famous mathematician. Um, and it is um, kind of uh, rigorously modeled uh, on real buildings in South India, so it kind of does this kind of double act of um, uh, kind of cultural preservation, conservation, um, kind of publicity for these uh, these artifacts that need to be preserved, 
Uh, it's also a glorious transmedia project. It has an album, it has a comic book. I, I'm not responsible for any of all of that. Um, I work with a uh, design consultancy called um, Quicksand, uh, and we have worked together to create uh, this game, um, and it's it's been it's been a joy. Um, but also, I think an extremely uh, good example of best practice when it comes to thinking of the archive in kind of more playful and more uh, engaging terms. Um, you know, the archive does not have to be you know the static um, place like the National Archives of India, for example. <laughs> um, so, so yes, yeah, so I just kind of wanted to um, kind of flag flag those two projects up. Um, right. So now to talk talk a little bit, bit more seriously about archives. Uh, and specifically the, the, the concept of representation within the archive. Uh, there is a tendency to perceive manifestations of technology as well as of the archive in metaphorical terms, which often results in an erasure of embodied materiality of the bodies that who perform, create, and populate those archives. As we continue our work in the digital humanities here in India, it is crucially important that we constantly remind ourselves that the threats of erasure that endanger corporeal bodies are readily reproduced in the digital archive unless there is every effort made to guard against this violence. In order for ethnology to live, Baudrillard asserted, its object must die. And by dying, the object takes its revenge for being discovered, and with its death, death defies the science that wants to grasp it. Mbembe, for example, um, gestures to the necessary death of the author, uh, of a document for it to, in order for it to enter the archive and acquire archival value. He uh, focuses on the historian's handling of dead and living time, with the archive forming both the original point from which historical time is constructed, as well as the sign of death. I would argue, though, that the digital moment complicates this notion of death as the starting point of the archive where event and comment, sorry, where event and comment collapses the notion of the mortal moment by inhabiting a state of always becoming. Considering the archive, therefore, requires a deeper examination of the pol pol politics of the archive itself, requiring an alertness to how seemingly neutral Western criteria and classifications, which were inherited as a colonial legacy, are in fact tools for maintaining the role of an archive as an imperial project of do domination and affirmation. The administrative archive, in the strict sense, is read-only memory. One cannot simply take out archival records because they are politically incorrect. Neither can the archival order as such be easily changed according to a new discursive will. Just like in computing, a rewriting of code in the operating system would make the whole function collapse. The rise of the modern nation state required a foundational narrative of its temporal genealogy, resulting in a reorganization of the archives, a Hegelian gesture, in the name of history. By the historical discourse, the administrative state, which is an infrastructural function and represents the symbolic order of power, could be transformed into an imaginary called nation. These are um, words from Wolfgang Ernst uh, in an amazing volume called uh, Decolonizing <coughs> Archives. Uh, it's free for download uh, online. Uh, it's published by a French um, think, think tank. I'm not even sure. I guess it's a collective called uh, Le Internationale. <laughs> My French is terrible. Um, but yes, please do have a look uh, because it's one of the few um, manifestos I've found around decolonizing archives. Um, but significantly, the post-colonial archive also followed this flattening logic. George Perec in Think Classify stated, behind every utopia, there is always some great taxonomic design, a place for everything and everything in its place. And it was precisely this utopian ambition that led Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister of the Indian Republic, to design his vision of the nation along what he called scientific Marxist lines what has come to be known as Nehruvian socialism. Nehru preferred to leave the emotional work of appealing to the masses, read the peasantry, to Gandhi, imagining in a rather patronizing fashion that they were unlikely to appreciate his dedication to the larger nationalist cause of scientific progress, which basically entailed championing large-scale industry over small-scale or cottage industry, which he felt were colonial throwbacks that would only hamper India from taking its rightful place on the international stage. Nehru was confused by spontaneous uprisings and the fact that the peasantry, who were by and large non-dominant caste, might envision another idea of India, which valued their labor and their ties to their lands, such as the Tebhaga movement, which was one of the first political peasant movements in the wake of independence um, to challenge the feudal landowners. 
Uh, and it was seen by Nehru as an inconvenient resistance to, uh, that undermined the much vaunted national agenda. You might ask, what has this got to do with the project of the digital humanities in India today? Uh, this, by the way, is an illustration by Somnath Hor, who was a Bengali artist who went to Tebhaga uh, to document the uprisings in the 19, late 1940s. So this happened yesterday. Um, <laughs> might seem quite familiar. <laughs> so the University Grants Commission, much in the way of the NEH, have um, threatened to cut funding but uh, very particularly um, funding that is dedicated to work on non dharmic caste and Dalit work. According to the ministry and the UGC sources who spoke to the Telegraph, this order has been sent to all those centers that have not been upgraded to a full-fledged department by the universities. And as I said earlier on, there's considerable institutional resistance in these universities. Hence, it's kind of a you know, chicken and egg thing. The, the department will never come into being. So they will just now uh, be gotten, gotten rid of. Uh, it's ironic that these centers which research uh, Dalits, BR and Dalit's philosophy, social exclusion, and inclusive uh, policies such as reservation are being closed down when the University Grants Commission is funding courses on Vedic studies. Um, Vedic studies is basically, um, uh, well, I guess a, a discipline that um, kind of advocates Hindutva, you know, the, the kind of Hindu right, um, and is obviously kind of not not um, not necessarily kind of in the interests of uh, kind of human uh, community. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I'm just going like so disgusting. I'm kind of losing my words now. Um, uh, so yes, so what I what I find really uh, kind of interesting but horrifying is that the 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 conversation from the Aru's time has not changed. This idea of you know the tech, techno social citizen as being the only kind of citizen who has a right to, to inhabit space in India in the interest of, uh, of scientific progress, um, and uh, as well as the fact that um, not only are we talking about decolonizing archives, we also necessarily have to talk about de-Brahmanizing archives, so you know, Brahmin being the, the most dominant caste. Um, because because my, much of this um, willful um, amnesia is put into place and sustained by um, dominant castes. Not you know it might be a hangover of uh, colonial oppression, but but it is very much perpetuated today by dominant castes. Um, this the timing of this particular uh, diktat is not coincidental. The blatant gesture of censorship by this current government is a predictable response and explicit attempt to shut down debates and protests that have been raging for some time now, to end the institutional violence against Dalit and non-dominant caste communities that has been evident in every sphere of Indian public life. These demands have recently been amplified by the suicides of two young scholars, Rohit Vemula, in early 2016, and whose death served as a flashpoint for widespread protests nationally, as well as Ranjini Krish, who tragically killed himself last week. Both Vemula and Chris, uh, Krish indict, indicted and implicated anti Dalit bias on the campuses of the country's most prominent universities. Judith Butler, by way of Banu Bargu, spoke, sorry, speaks of how protest in an age of seemingly decorporate. Yeah, <laughs> decorporealized warfare, sorry, think of drones, for example, is being performed by voluntary human shields who sacrifice, or at the very least calculate, consequences with their own bodies, reckoning on themselves as embodied human capital. These strategies, described by Butler and Bargu, I would argue, have been deployed by both Vemula and by Krish, instrumentalizing themselves in order to retaliate and by doing so, splitting the binary of victim and agent. The anxieties incumbent on representing traumatized bodies such as this, as outlined in the examples above, are provoked by questions of representation and who has the right to represent any category or movement. The absence of an ethics of infrastructural care by technology corporations such as Twitter, Facebook, and Google diminish the agency of personhood to a spectral presence. Namrita Gaikwad has eloquently argued that a theory of haunting is an effective methodology to, quote, understand the complexity of postcolonial modernity and its silences. And I feel that these silences of postcolonial modernity can also be transposed to the key of neoliberal neglect, as practiced by these hegemonic technology corporations, which regulate our actions and activities in virtual spaces, demonstrating that hegemony, as Derrida says, still organizes the repression and thus the confirmation of a haunting. Haunting belongs to every hegemony. 
Um, and the reason why this is particularly p pertinent is that um, one reason why the, the Dalit struggle has been increasingly uh, visible and um, potentially being considered a danger to the administration is that um, many of them now have access to the internet, are uh, well-educated, are English-speaking, and use a platform such as Facebook, uh, Twitter, WhatsApp for mobilization, for protest. Um, and Rohit Vemula very famously um, kind of wrote a long kind of Facebook posts about, um, about his life, about what it was like to be Dalit. Um, and so this, this is a wonderful initiative. Um, uh, a journalist called Nikila Henry, actually, after Vemula's death, uh, went back and collected up uh, many of these Facebook statuses and uh, put them into a book that was published last year, uh, which was a great act of um, of you know, repatriation in a sense from from the corporate kind of behemoth that is Facebook, uh, because uh, many of these people are are on uh, watch lists and um, if there is any kind of instruction from the government to delete their accounts, that can happen. Um, and so this kind of work is extremely important, um, and I'll speak a little bit more about that at the end of this talk. Um, yes, while digital space allows for public memory to be restored, gaps intentionally made or otherwise to be filled, the specters of victims of enacted violence are ghosts in the machine, especially when relegated to the margins by proprietary algorithms. What this demonstrates is that while writing the struggles of non-dominant groups out of the archive is evidently due to lack of institutional will, it is also politically expedient as a strategy and has been since India gained independence in 1947. While it might be imagined that digitization could be a democratizing tool to challenge the authority of the archive, it is only too easy to replicate um, established Western narratives and to turn it into a pseudo-democratic end in itself, resulting in an overload of the material available online. A meaningful act of digital archiving, therefore, must be performed at the level of epistemological understanding, ontological authenticity, sca scaffolded appropriately by interface and by code, in order to interrogate the existing archive as well as to expand its scope. Um, a particularly salient point that Pramod Nair, who, has, who is one of the few scholars I know who has done work on the digital Dalit, is that the potential of the digital Dalit to connect with communities of interest which uh, posit an alternative history of India as one of um, discrimination, but one that also intersects with global concerns about race and race-based discrimination. Therefore, one needs to see the self-representation and presence of Dalits in such websites as a force that enables sorry, transnationalization by appealing to and fitting themselves around a global historical narrative of oppression, torture, and trauma. This visibility has allowed for forging of new alliances. Dalit activism, when it goes online, Naya writes, enables a transnational subaltern project seeking and establishing links with sympathizers, activists, NGOs, transnational organizations, but also as well with um, people with other histories of oppression, the blacks mainly, but also African Americans. The surfacing of the hashtag Dalit Lives Matter soon after Black Lives Matter, and the increasingly vocal rallying behind both causes online, allowed allies in both communities to find each other and to develop structures of mutual support. One of the best examples of this transnational friendship found expression in the collaborative events organized by Dalit Women Fight, Um, yes, um, with grassroots Black Lives Matter activists in 2016, DWF, founded by Thinmunzi Samdurajan, is a visual chronicle of the activities of the All India Dalit Mahila Adhikar Manch, an association of Dalit women activists who organize a month-long yatra or campaign, traveling through India, visiting every state, and uh, holding public meetings where they undertook the Ambedkarite tenets of educate, organize, and agitate. They worked in collaboration with local groups to publicize the Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Tribe Prevention of Act Atrocities Act and to help provide recourse to justice for caste-based violence as well as support for survivors. The Munch organized uh, events to take these claims to institutional authorities in the face of opposition and aggression, lending solidarity and knowledge to communities, um, to those who might not have felt empowered enough to assert themselves with the, without the support of this larger network. DWF uh, presents an alternative visual narrative to one that has historically accrued to Dalit womanhood. And here we've got some images. Um, 
I, I, I would argue that um, the kind of the way that the Dalit female body has been uh, parsed is usually one of abjection and victimhood, and that the digital archive has um, acted to considerable alter this this kind of uh, narrative around the Dalit female body. Dalit grassroots activist Manisha Mashal, who has been active in the movement since 2005, describes how significant the ownership and representation of Dalit identity online has been. Quote, when the group was started, we were not avid users of Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. It was in 2013 that we first used the hashtag Dalit Woman Fight. We took the Yatra to the USA as well. We spoke in about 22 universities about our struggle. We talked about how Dalit women are suffering and being discriminated against. Yes, definitely, there has been some transformation. Earlier, the media used to remain totally mute on our issues. In all those years, we took workshops trying to educate people on how social media and mainstream media is not benefiting us. It was not helping our cause or our struggle. So we endorsed the idea of creating and furthering our own voice through the same media, but by creating our own media, counter media platforms. And I think this is one reason why Dalit Women Fight is um, remarkable, because it hasn't only um, harnessed uh, kind of existing social platforms, but has kind of created a space for itself. Um, that way we can, so, so through this, through this uh, social media movement, we can find out what is happening in Uttar Pradesh, in Haryana, and other states. The Dalit movement is shaped by this transformation. The women's struggle in the Dalit movement is only beginning to find its place, and we are working on that. The Dalit women fight is one such step towards liberation of Dalit women, close quote. As a dominant caste, urban, privileged, English-speaking feminist, I am aware of the threat posed to the narrative of our own multivalent feminist heritage being overwhelmed by those whose love levels of access to institutional knowledge and status means that their work is often parsed as definitive. The historical recovery of the pre-colonial and colonial past and the post-colonial formation of the nation state have unsurprisingly dominated post-colonial feminist thought in South Asia. Indeed, as Maitre Choudhury uh, asserts, it was feminist historical research that laid the grounds for theorizing feminism in the region. However, it might be that the understandable preoccupation with undoing the legacy of colonial epistemologies and knowledges meant that the archive, or the idea of the archive, was only perceived as a site of imperial control rather than one that might be activated to produce new epistemological formations. There has never been a greater need or possibility than now to archive India's multifaceted feminist heritage. This will be incredibly difficult, yet essential task that will not only grant posterity and legitimacy to the various strands of thought and activism that have defined the movement, but also enlarge understandings of what it means to be a feminist in India by accommodating contrasting and fluid ontologies that are marked by local, regional, and other specificities. This is particularly crucial given that there is a danger of this narrative being overwhelmed by Indian dominant caste English-speaking feminists due to, the, due to their access but also their inclination to use social media and other tools for their feminist work. And I think um, it's been very interesting that I've been speaking to communities out with um, the big metropolitan cities and many of them have said that they don't use social media to protest, they use social media to mobilize but most protest actually happens on the ground and in the streets. And so there's a kind of, um, there's, there, there's an over-determination on this idea that social media feminism in India is, um, basically defines what happens um, in the feminist sphere, uh, which is very, very far from the truth. I'm trying to... Uh, and this is a brilliant example, actually, of um, how, how that narrative can be undermined. So this is Khabar Laharia, which is a, a newspaper that is... <laughs> Uh, run um, entirely by um, non-dominant caste women. Uh, they write all the reports, they uh, do all the journalism, uh, it's very grassroots. Uh, it also now has an English version, which also has a social media uh, channel, but um, but yeah, again, like Dalit Women Fight, it is a, it is a space out with the social media um, hegemony, so that allows them to kind of articulate their, their own archive. Um, so I think what I'm gesturing towards is this idea of an archive of the commons, um, a citizen's archive, um, one that would allow openness, um, that one, one that would allow hybrid and mutable taxonomies, collective production, and universal accessibility. Um, and there's, there's obviously kind of a lot of work to be done here. Uh, I was extremely fortunate in one of those kind of... Uh, happy coincidences to meet this gentleman um, called T.B. Danish, who runs um, a non-profit organization around technology called Jan Janastu, 
Uh, and he has been working on this amazing project um, about annotating the web, and which kind of obviously moves the web away from its kind of corporate um, uh, avatar and to a more kind of decentralized kind of um, uh, kind of I guess the the idea of the web as it was originally envisioned. For so for those of you who have used um, uh, um, hi, is it kind of is it hyperbole the the hypothesis? Yeah, hypothesis. Thank you. Hypothesis. Um, it's it's kind of like a similar similar idea. Um, so where you as a user kind of uh, create an inclusive community where you share your annotations, uh, and so therefore every single person making those annotations um, can and they can do it. They don't even necessarily have to write it. They can record it or they can take photographs. So they don't necessarily have to have high literacy levels. They are creating their own ontologies and their own um, systems to define their own art. Uh, so Dinesh and I are now going to be working together. We, we met like for the first time two weeks ago and we're very excited. Um, so hopefully, you know, watch this space and we, we will be um, working towards um, putting something together that hopefully might serve these purposes. Um, I'd just like to end with this, uh, with this gorgeous poem that I found. Uh, and it's completely by coincidence that it is by a Native American poet. Um, and I want to kind of particularly emphasize that this this um, this verse, where um, Hogan says, um, "The forgotten clay of his beginnings, after nakedness and fear of something larger, these he named wolf, bear, other, as if they had not been there before his words, had not other tongues and powers, or sung themselves into life before him." And it kind of made me think about naming and how important naming is in the projects that we do. Because to name is to own, to name is to claim, claim on culture, as sure as planting a flag on the shores of another. To name is to assert authority, control of the narrative, to write the world into being. And never has the act of um, naming been so significant. As we try to navigate our digital universe, the stars that shine the brightest and are the easiest to find are the constellations that we care to name on our maps that outshine the others by sheer conviction of being. But of course, we all hold up the sky and so must strive to write our names and stars across that sky together. in certain ways, but uh, a talk demands, as the poet says, original response, right? Form of love. So if there is original response out here, we will have it voiced. I just wanted to thank you so much for a really wonderful talk and covering so many really important intersectional issues. I work on a Chicana feminist archive that um, deals in a lot of the same sort of realms and collapsing public and institutional spaces and community spaces. Um, if you could just speak briefly to some of the challenges you've encountered, I think you did a really beautiful job articulating your work and the victories you've had, but it would mean a lot to me to understand how you've come uh, you know, you've overcome those various challenges that I'm sure have been there at every conceivable level. Thank you. Um, I wouldn't say I've overcome them at all. <laughs> it's very much a reality of, of my everyday existence. Um, thank you so much for your question, though. Um, I would say one of the major, um, well, the steep learning curves has been being extremely alert to not appropriating and um, making sure that representation is done in as um, extensive and thorough ways as possible. So one way um, by which we're thinking of, of doing this, I'm, I'm working with um, some friends in the Dalit community, is um, creating self-archiving toolkits. So giving activists these toolkits to, because as many people have pointed out, there's also questions of privacy, because you're not opting into the social media archive. So, um, so just giving them the, the, the tools and also just the understanding of the possibility and the implications it has for their history because uh, because so much of this activity is happening online 
I'm very, very afraid that like 10 or 15 years down the line, it's going to be a gap. And, uh, you know, we can't afford that. Uh, they can't afford that. Um, so, yes, so I think kind of making sure that we're not appropriating, but we're enabling, facilitating, amplifying as much as possible, as always, is always a struggle. Um, I think the other, other kind of um, specter in the room is the government um, and how we work around what the government permits. Um, yeah, you know, we just try not to get caught by giving talks. <laughs> it's probably not the best way to avoid that. But, um, but yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I think it's just also, money is also an issue. I mean, you know, let's be real. Um, we're trying to kind of, uh, you know, Alex Gill's work on minimal computing has been hugely helpful and he's been helping me to think about, you know, how we can set up servers and get people to look after their own servers. But there's also a lot of, uh, there's a lot of fear and apprehension around that kind of um, work with technology. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a very, very difficult project when it comes to kind of just the financial, and as I said, the UGC doesn't consider it a funding priority, it doesn't consider it a, a subject, so uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for a wonderful talk. I thought, um, I don't really have a question, just sort of a, I wanted to connect a few dots that I saw that were super important. Um, specifically, I don't remember uh, on the five or six things that you had that we should rethink um, if technology itself was on that. <laughs> because I think that's one of the key things that you yourself brought up at multiple points in the talk that there's these points where we have to start questioning sort of the business, business governmental shape that technology has and realize that that itself is totally historically contingent and part of that inherited Western narrative from Silicon Valley to Washington, D.C. Um, and that I think what I was particularly interested in is then the ways that one can start thinking of platforms for new types of expression, new types of being in the world digitally that aren't necessarily based on large C, you know, for-profit companies such as um, uh, Facebook, Twitter, whatever else. And that, you know, the nefarious deeds that they're using all of our information for it that we all know if we'd sat in on the crypto uh, party. <laughs> so I, I only encourage you to think through that part even more and to push on it even more. Uh, yeah, just very briefly, uh, if I can respond to that, something that we do at Trishti a lot is uh, is pushing back against the solutioning or the solutionist um, kind of impulse of design. Because you know we te we're teaching designers, and you know they they all buy into this idea of design as the panacea and you know the solution. And so it's been uh, it's been really interesting to get them to think critically about design. And I think so we've been starting there. So we've been you know getting them to think about cultural interfaces and about you know. The, the kind of you know that it is not inevitable that you use these technologies. Uh, community radio, for example, is, is something that you know has been really useful for protest and for activism, uh, and is a technology. You know, uh, Ramesh Srinivasan, whose book has just come out, and I think it's called Who's Global Village. He he's been doing some fantastic work around this. Um, so yeah, if you want to check him out, I think he's at UCLA. Yeah. This was beautiful. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, uh, just a, a question actually to elaborate on the last question or sort of prompt there as well to think a little bit about or to, we could invite you to, to think a little bit or let us um, to talk a little bit more about the ways that this sort of practice has also intervened in pedagogical models as Ruthie. So um, what kinds of curricula we're seeing that's newly being developed and how it's changed from what was there previously. Can this only be done at an institute that is an art, design, technology kind of institute? And I imagine no, but <laughs> so. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I, I, it, it's interesting because I had the opportunity to go to Shishti and do this work. Um, it kind of helped me to kind of you know leave the baggage of digital humanities being in the literary studies space behind. So I never had to kind of you know battle with you know it, it being an outcome of humanities computing, digital humanities, you know that that whole narrative. Um, I think what what we have found and hopefully this kind of way of thinking will make its way into other digital humanities projects is that, um, is that it's productive for students 
to think about their everyday technologies as not only the tablet and the phone, but also bicycles and, you know, um, the kind of radios and, you know, everything, reading books. I mean, you know, if you say to a student, a book is a technology, they're like, oh, really? <laughs> um, so, so, you know, so I have been trying in my own pedagogy and, you know, my big book history hat, I guess, kind of comes, comes in here, but um, to kind of, you know, get them to think about technology not only as the digital, um, because that is obviously so overdetermined and so, um, so legislated kind of by, by these, uh, these modes. Um, yeah, I think critical making, I think, has, you know, despite what I said earlier on about how it's very difficult to do that kind of work in, in India because we don't have um, models or prototypes, um, it's still been great. I mean, our students uh, did this great project this year where they were looking at Bangalore and they were like, oh, you know, it's the IT city and, you know, it's all about Silicon Valley and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, what happens to old technology? And they're all around, like, in their early 20s. And they were like, yeah, and, you know, why do hipsters like typewriters? Like, what's that about? <laughs> and, and I was like, I don't know. I don't know, go get a typewriter. And then they went and they met this typewriter collector who, who was also remarkable. Um, and then they hacked it um, in order to generate images. Um, and this was part of actually Shrishi does something called the Festival of Stories, which is um, which is a collaboration with our uh, subway, our metro metro system. So we have um, kind of art in public spaces, and so they just set up this typewriter, and when you type on it, it generates images. And then they just spoke to people when they encountered the typewriter and just asked them, you know, how they felt about it and what what did they think. And one reason why they chose images was they wanted to um, undercut the idea that the typewriter was something that people only typed English on. Um, because because interestingly, near the metro station is the High Court, the Supreme Court, and I'm oh, sorry, the High Court, and um, there are lots of people, the stenographers who type in Kannada, which is our, which is the local language on typewriters. Um, so they kind of wanted to play with that idea. They wanted to play with the idea of obsolescence, technological obsolescence. Also, you know, people who'd never seen a typewriter before, not necessarily because of how old they were, but just because of access. So, so you know, it was a playful, I, I thought it was a really nice way of working with, you know, getting their hands dirty and, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, working with technology. So, yeah. I think everybody has been an exemplary audience, but it is, it is time to, that you sustained us and, and now we shall sustain you. Uh, uh, but I do want to say, um, a year and almost a week from today, uh, March 22nd, 23rd, 2018, our next symposium will be, and I want you to think about that on your calendars mentally and hopefully physically, and then rejoin us for uh, a new and uh, can't be better, but equally urgent conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.